Hey there, welcome back to Point of Sale, the retail supply chain show where we break down great retailers, the supply chains that move them, and the data they use to make decisions. I'm your host, Andrew Cox, and senior retail analyst here at Freight Waves, and this is our first live episode of Point of Sale. We typically record these, but there are a couple reasons we wanted to do this live. One is that the lineup is just so good that we felt we needed to do it live. And the second one is that this is a sustainability-focused episode of Point of Sale. So we wanted to make sure we fit it into what I'm calling Earth Week, because I think Earth Day doesn't quite give our planet justice. It deserves more than 24 hours. So today we're going to talk to a retailer that is offsetting all of its shipping emissions through the help of Flexport.org. So we have Tatcha, who is a premier beauty brand uh, with Japanese products that are sold all over the world, but uh, especially here in the U.S. So we're going to speak to Lauren Schilling. She is a sustainability lead and the project manager of uh, this project that Tatcha has taken on. And also Susie Schoenberg, who is a familiar face to Freightwaves TV. She is the founder and head of Flexport.org. But before we do that, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, ArcBest. ArcBest is more than logistics. Whatever you do, whatever you ship, ArcBest makes it easier for you to do business. ArcBest combines reliable capacity, innovative technology, and trusted relationships to take the complexity out of your supply chain and keep your shipments moving. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so excited for this. I've been looking forward to this for many weeks. I know you have as well. We've been putting some planning into this, so I'm glad it's finally here. Thanks for joining me. Yep, thanks for having us. Great to be here. And it's great to see you again, Andrew. Yes, absolutely. Great to see you too, Susie. Let's start very high level, and I'll start with you, Lauren. Let's just talk about the relationship between Flexport.org and Tatcha. What is the extent of it, and what are the benefits to Tatcha? Yeah, so um, Tatcha's been using Flexport for our freight for, I think, a couple of years now. Um, and I know uh, I work pretty closely with our operations team, and so just hearing about all of the efficiencies that they gain from Flexport and all of the really easy to use dashboards. Um, I think particularly now more than ever when supply chains are getting so complicated, uh, Flexport just provides some really great solutions to be able to keep tabs on where everything is and what's going on and, and to have that trail of um, paperwork that makes it easy for a finance team. And Susie, what are the things that Flexport.org provides to Tatcha to enable them to offset their emissions and work with you? So Flexport.org has different components. We really want to help the companies to tackle social sustainability issues, but also environmental ones. And with regards to supply chain, there are two major areas where we can be supportive. Number one is everything around the carbon emissions. So we can help you to think through how do you measure your carbon emissions? How can you reduce them? And lastly, for everything you can't reduce, how can you compensate for your carbon emissions? Because it's very clear that we have to take action now and that we can't wait until we have hopefully vessels that don't produce any carbon at all. Um, and the second element where we also can advise companies on is what to do with their products. So they could be helpful donations to organizations in need, but it also helps companies to reduce their waste if they don't have to put product on landfill, um, but they can donate it to organizations. And, you know, as we were talking about the product, there are also many product decisions a company has to make. And sometimes this can influence the emissions as well. And so we are partners for any questions related to the supply chain. Absolutely. And we'll come back to talk a little bit about how the virtuous cycle of focusing on sustainability and shipping uh, also has spillover effects to many of the other decisions that you make operationally. But uh, Lauren, I do want to ask, like, why focus on shipping emissions? Why has Tatcha <clears throat> chosen shipping? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'd say in looking at our sustainability programs, we wanted to focus first on kind of low hanging fruit. And when you think about carbon, it's kind of it's really overwhelming, right, because everything has kind of a carbon emission or a footprint. Um, and so for us, uh, shipping was really just kind of the easiest place for us to start and focus on because it's the part of our supply chain that we have the most control over. Um, so we don't own any of our manufacturing facilities. We don't own any of our farms for our ingredients. And so that data is a lot harder to come by. Um, and so having a partner like Flexport.org where we could see all of that data and then they were also really helpful in um, ways that we could collect data from our other shipping vendors and process it all in one place. Um, it was kind of a no-brainer that that would be a great place to start. 
And Lauren, what is the value of allowing experts like Flexport.org to take control over some of the things that may not be, um, you know, you say shipping is in, within your control, but it's kind of, these are difficult things, uh, tracking emissions, measuring these things. What is it like allowing experts to take control of some of that? It is phenomenal. Um, we have kind of a smaller team at Tatcha, and so just the amount of legwork that goes into all of those calculations, there are so many factors that you're looking at, you know, from weight, method of transportation, destination, you know, and then how many miles total that is. Um, having a partner like Flexport.org where I can just shoot over the raw data and say, this is your problem now. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. It's just kind of a godsend. And Susie, on your end, what is it like having uh, working with Tatcha? Is there things that you're also learning from them? What is that like? Totally. So first of all, I would also like just like to compliment Tatcha and especially Lauren and her team, because yes, you know, supply chain is an area where they have control over and they're kind of making the decisions for how to ship. But on the other hand, there are many, many companies that don't even consider shipping emissions to be part of their carbon footprint. Although we know based on our data that the emissions from shipping can make up 30 to about 50% of your total footprint. So I think it's great that Touch is looking at this element and realizing how big the impact can be if they're working on their shipment emissions. For us, Tatcha has been a phenomenal partner because they take this topic really serious. And that means that they're not only looking at their emissions from international shipping, but they're also considering kind of emissions that arise when you're shipping the goods from the warehouse to the end customer. So they're thinking very holistically about it. Um, and as Laura mentioned, she shares all the different data files with us. So Flexport.org is not only calculating the emissions that come from the shipments that we manage directly, but from the whole supply chain. And by getting those data sheets, we can also learn how we can improve our technology to make the process even easier in the future. So there's definitely a lot that we learn too from this amazing partnership. Susie, I'm glad you said that about how serious Tatcha is because that's this is a big point that it's not just about current and future emissions that you guys are looking to offset. You also looked retroactively at all the emissions that you've had since founding. So can you talk about why you decided to do that? And uh, was it a difficult and expensive process that it seemingly should be from the outside? Yeah, um, so that was something as we started down this road with Flexport and they said, you know, we can do this great offset program for you and you should get us some of the data. Um, we just started thinking, well, you know, if we start looking backwards, how much would that cost? And let's just kind of explore that. Because another big reason that we wanted to do shipping is that, as you said, we are kind of a Japanese inspired skincare company. And so all of our production is happening in Japan. And so kind of the footprint of having that production there, shipping it all the way to California, um, and then distributing it, we know that that's a pretty significant um, operation. And so as we started collecting all of this data, we realized that it's actually incredibly affordable for us to do this. Um, and so I would say that with Flexport, they just made it really easy to get them that data and for them to process it. Um, and then the cost was not prohibitive at all. And we were like, this is something that is easy for us to do. Um, it's going to make a huge impact. And so for us, it was kind of a no brainer. So let's talk about a third component of this or a third company that's involved in this partnership and this project, and that's carbonfund.org. I know that this company plays a huge role in, in both Flexport.org's operations and also allowing Tatcha to um, track and trace where these carbon offsets are going to. So Lauren, let's start with you and just, uh, and we'll bounce this to Susie after, but let's just talk about the importance of carbonfund.org. Yeah, so um, I was really incredibly encouraged to see CarbonFund.org was uh, the partner for Flexport. Uh, it's kind of a, a joke around the office that people know not to really talk to me about carbon offsets, just because they are not all created equally. And I think we're so used to seeing programs that aren't really well flushed out and they don't actually do that much good. Um, I have kind of a background in, in grassroots conservation works and just seeing a lot of the on the ground um, carbon offset projects where it's like, oh, we do tree planting. And then you go to actually see the project and people are just throwing seeds out a window and you're like, 
that's not really carbon offsetting. So we really wanted to make sure that if we were going to do carbon offsets, that it was something that we felt like we could stand behind and we knew that it was verified um, and that we were actually able to offset the emissions that we were doing. And so just hearing Flexport talk about Carbon Fund and looking at how Carbon Fund approaches those offset programs um, and all of kind of those safeties that they have in place to ensure that you are actually having the impact that you think you are was just really amazing. And Susie, do you have anything to add about the importance for of carbonfund.org for Flexport? Totally. Um, maybe I can just like highlight a few questions that companies could ask themselves if they're selecting their carbon offset provider. So carbonfund.org foundation is a nonprofit that helps individuals, but also businesses to offset their carbon footprint. And so they're a really well established organization that has been doing it for a really long time. And so questions that I would encourage you to ask is one, how are your carbon offsets are being produced? In the case of carbonfund.org foundation, they support energy efficiency projects, forestry, but also renewable energy projects. So it's a wide portfolio, right? And this is the point that Lauren just mentioned. You want to make sure that it's really measurable, you know, what is happening in those projects, that they are verified, so which standards are applied. Then there is a question that is called additionality. So that means you want to make sure that your contribution, so your carbon offsets, actually enable something new to happen so that we have a real net new gain and that we don't support, let's say, business activity as usual, right? We want to really make sure the carbon emissions are being offset. And that also means that every credit that Tatcha is buying actually is only available when a ton of CO2 has been offset somewhere. So it's connected to, you know, real activity. And lastly, you should can also think about, you know, do your offsets qualify for programs like the UN Clean Development Plan? Right? So there are certain initiatives and you want to make sure that your good work can be recognized. And ideally, you know, we haven't talked about co-benefits. Many projects have benefits beyond the environmental impact. And so it's great to consider those as well, especially if you want to share your impact with your consumers um, too. Yeah, that and is I'll like just perfect. build off of that really, really quickly. Um, but I think the other thing that is so great about carbonfund.org is that they consider leakage, which is basically looking at what are the kind of other benefits, as you said, or um, shortcomings of a project. And so that really helps combine kind of the social component with the environmental of just ensuring that there are no negative externalities that are going to arise because of the project. So an example of that would be sometimes... Um, if you look at projects that help protect rainforests by empowering local indigenous groups, some of those aren't set up in a way where that's actually acknowledged by the local government, which can add increased friction between indigenous groups and local governments. And those can often um, result in violence or further displacement. And so it's really making sure that we're doing our due diligence and having as many positive and as few negative impacts as possible. Lauren, I think exactly. there's another... And also Please go ahead, oh, permanence is also very important, right? You want to make sure that your contribution enables a project that will con consist over a longer period of time and that, you know, your the projects only run for a year, right? Then we don't have a permanent effect. So there are many different criteria that matter. And as, you know, Lauren said, and not all carbon offsets are created equal. That's right. They are not. But I do want to, I think there's another point here about carbonfund.org and, and just being able to uh, select and understand where the carbon, uh, where the offsets are going to. And I think it's kind of about aligning the values of the outcomes of the project with the values of the company. So talk to me a little bit about that and about what kind of project you guys have selected uh, at Tatcha. Yeah, absolutely. That was another great thing about carbonfund.org is that they do have a portfolio of projects you can choose from. And so while our sustainability team is saying, yes, we should do carbon offsets because that's the right thing to do, our marketing team is kind of saying, that's great, but also how can we storytell and make sure that our consumers are aware of this and grow that affinity for the brand? And so in looking from that marketing angle, it's really nice to be able to choose from a portfolio because we can select projects that are more in line with our brand and make sense from a storytelling perspective. Um, and so for us, that was really great because we ended up choosing a truck stop electrification project. Um, and so since we are uh, offsetting all of our uh, emissions through transportation, it was kind of this really nice full circle moment to be able to say that we're reinvesting and making sure 
that transportation is a lower emission sector and that we're having these projects in the U.S., which is where we do a lot of our um, distribution. And then going back to kind of that that social component, it's nice to be able to say we're reducing emissions, but then also the people impact of making sure that you know, truck stop idling is a really big issue for the people that live in that local area because there are so many admissions and you look at um, the effect that it could have on on truck drivers. And this is something that is going to improve the, the health of all of the people in those communities. Susie, is this storytelling is allowing the marketing and the sustainability teams to be happy with the project? Is this how we create more of these types of projects? Absolutely. And again, you know, many folks might not have even known that this technology exists. Um, and it's also great to show that carbon offset programs can actually create jobs, by, right, by fostering those technologies that can be deployed. Um, and I feel there's also like a big education that we as, you know, companies can provide to consumers um, to really showcase kind of all the benefits of those environmental projects. And as Lauren said, because there's so many different options for mitigating your carbon footprint, you hopefully will find one that aligns really well either with your footprint. So maybe you want to have an impact, you know, in the areas where the majority of your production happens or it's related to the product that you are producing. And so I strongly believe um, that we can match those projects closely with the company's footprint and mission. And Lauren, talk to me a little bit about how uh, this type of partnership where you're focusing on sustainability, maybe only on shipping uh, in this case, tell me the spillover effects. Talk to me about how this type of focus on sustainability in one area of your supply chain spills over to many other areas and other places where you make decisions. Yeah, um, I would say that really putting kind of a dollar amount, I mean, we already do with the cost of shipping, but the additional uh, fee of paying for the carbon offset it helps create this ripple effect where now it's not just looking at, okay, air freight is obviously more expensive and more expensive to offset. But if we look at, you know, what we're doing in terms of freight, are we really utilizing our entire pallet and are we utilizing our entire container? And so that kind of ripples down into our packaging decisions of, is there a better way for us to design this where it could be lighter and that would save us some money, or we could make the box more in line with the shape of the actual product to be able to fit more of those in a container, et cetera. And so you can really kind of start seeing that framework spill out into all of these other different areas um, that help us reduce our carbon emissions and then also save our operations team some money. And Susie, this is something that you, I think, mentioned at the top of the show. This is something that Flexport helps out with, flexport.org, that is, helps out with um, other types of supply chain decisions beyond just offsetting carbon. Can you speak to it a little bit? Totally. So, for example, a packaging decision might affect the weight of the goods shipped, Right. And so we can calculate what the alternative carbon footprint will be. Maybe a company decides to actually try to shift modes, you know, from air freight to ocean freight. And we can also there just uh, calculate the difference. And again, you know, it would in this case also be cheaper um, and really help you to kind of weigh all the different criteria. We are totally aware that you have certain production schedules, right, that might limit your choices, that you have certain transit time requirements. And so we understand that just like general Tips might not really help you to create an actionable plan. And this is where we have a dedicated team where we can discuss your situation or if you want to open a new warehouse and really run through those different scenarios so that you can incorporate the environmental component into your decision making. There's just kind of one more point that I want to make before we move on. It's just the this is a virtuous cycle that kind of gets created. Like what, what is good for the planet is generally good for business. And I just didn't know if you had anything to add on that, uh, Lauren, because I think, you know, we'll, we'll talk in a moment about what's driving the adoption of these pledges, what's driving companies to, to build more sustainable uh, supply chains. And it's at every level from consumer all the way up. But what, can you talk about the, the virtuous cycle that has to happen, you know, that, that what is good for the planet and also good for business? Yeah, I would just say that that's something that's been um, incredibly nice to see kind of the proof in the pudding of that you don't have to choose between good business and sustainability. The two can go hand in hand. And that when you're making the business case for sustainability, it often is that things that are going to be good for the environment can help you save money if you're doing things in a more sustainable way. And so if you're looking at waste in a business is obviously bad for your bottom line because that means you paid for things that you're not using. Um, likewise, for the environment, if you're reducing your waste, that's a win in that column as well. So I'd say it's been really nice to kind of have this as a first case study to kind of um, bolster support within the organization that, okay, it wasn't so scary. We did it with carbon offsets. 
And now let's see what else we can tackle and get those same returns. So I've got a question for both of you. And this is, uh, we've seen a lot of net zero carbon pledges. We just had the net zero carbon summit uh, at Freight Waves yesterday. And we see a lot of pledges uh, from big companies out in 2030, 2040, or even further out from there. And I just wanted to, to ask you both, because as, a, as Lauren, as you are working through a pledge right now, working to bring down emissions, and Susie, you helping companies bring down their emissions, when you see these pledges, how can you tell whether these pledges have any substance beyond the, the pretty commercials with nice landscapes and the windmills and the solar panels? How can you tell if the pledge is actually has anything behind it? We'll start with you, Lauren. Yeah, so I would say um, looking at how they're planning on achieving that, is it solely through offsets, but there's no plan to kind of look inward at their own operations and reduce from that end? And that to me is going to be the biggest kind of flag. Um, and so I know for us, it's kind of a conversation over what are our current emissions? Um, what can we do in the meantime? But then also, what do we have coming down the road that we can do to kind of impact? And there was this one um, lecture I was listening to, and he had kind of this great example where when we talk about climate change, people kind of talking about slowing down our emissions, et cetera. And he said, well, if you're Thelma and Louise, you don't want to slow down your approach to the cliff because you're still going to go over it at some point. So we need to find ways to actually back that car up. Um, and so for us, it's looking at ways of are there better ways we can be growing our ingredients so that it's actually regenerative agriculture and we're drawing more carbon out of the environment than we're going to release during um, our production. And Susie, do you have anything to add about, you know, looking at some of these pledges, how we can tell if they have any validity to them? I feel that sometimes partnerships can be a good indication because, you know, company has to tackle so many different just like elements of sustainability, it's almost impossible to do it by yourself. And by working with certain experts in specific fields, it's way easier to identify the concrete next steps that you will be taking. Um, and I also want to just encourage companies, sometimes, you know, you don't even have to make a massive pledge to get started. Even just like small steps, you know, are really, really important. And I believe that a company of any size, no matter if you're small or big, kind of tackle you know, the problem and I feel our partnership is a good example of also companies coming together can be really impactful to make sure that you actually really reach your goals and that you're not only announce them. I'm glad you said that because that is the reason we're doing this. Uh, we're having this conversation to show people that no matter the size of your company, this Tasha has grown into quite a large uh, beauty brand. Uh, it doesn't matter the size of your company. These are not things that are extremely unaffordable. It just takes a little bit of effort and partnerships. I think uh, that is a, a great point that you made, Susie. Let's talk about what's driving the surge in these pledges. I know that we, of course, we, we, you talk to um, environmental experts. They say that we have these strong deadlines that we need to make by 2030 or 2040 uh, to make sure that we don't burn this beautiful planet we have up. But let's, let's talk about it. Is it the consumers that's driving this at Tatcha, Lauren, or is it uh, the sustainability team? Team led by yourself, who's, who's, who's driving this? So I'd say it's um, kind of motivation from a lot of different areas. It's, you know, team members like myself, it's leadership, it's consumers. Um, Tatcha, from the beginning, we wanted to have an impact beyond just skincare. And so we actually also have a, a long running partnership with Room to Read supporting girls' education in um, different countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. And so I think for us, when we think about sustainability, we want to be mindful that we are being intersectional and looking at the social and environmental. And so part of that, I think, is looking at, well, who are the people that are suffering most from climate change? And, you know, that those are mostly people in Asia and Africa that are kind of not as well insulated from the effects of these increasing um, climates. And so for us, it's like, OK, if we really want to have a positive impact, we need to not just be affecting this one piece, but we need to understand how this entire system operates and what we can do in these different places. So I think for us, it's it's wanting to have a positive impact and then also just seeing that our customers want us to have that impact as well. Um, and that just helps kind of keep us going. And as a follow up, has there been in, any reaction? I know you, the marketing team uh, has been storytelling this, uh, this project. What has been the reaction from consumers? Yeah, it's been great so far. I think we um, kind of opened up our sustainability page on our website and we have kind of a dedicated email. And once we kind of put out there that we were on this journey and we're having this conversation and you know, sustainability is a really tricky thing because even as we went into carbon offsets, right, there's so many facets in there to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Um, and so just kind of having that dialogue and saying, 
you know, we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to come out and suddenly 100% be carbon neutral our first day. Um, but this is a long-term change that we're making. And this is, you know, our goal that we're marching towards. We've gotten a lot of people writing in who are supportive, um, who have suggestions. So it's just been really great to engage um, on that level and then kind of use that feedback to inform marketing and product development. Right, design thinking, we love it. Uh, Susie, <laughs> what about you? When, when companies are coming to Flexport.org looking to uh, offset their carbon emissions, what are their reasons for doing so? So historically, transportation hasn't been a focus in international climate agreements. And the reason was pretty simple. They couldn't, first of all, it was really hard to measure the emissions. And then they couldn't decide for how to split the emissions. Because typically in this global climate agreements, a country is disclosing their national greenhouse gas inventory. And then they're setting goals. But if a ship, you know, is kind of going from... Uh, Asia to the US where you might be selling your product, you know, it's not clear would you split the emissions in half? Should the company that is owning the ship be responsible for those emissions? And then it depends on where they're headquartered. What we have seen in the last decade where we have made progress in certain industries is that the emissions from transportation are still increasing and they are projected to double also in the coming years. So it's pretty clear that we have to tackle this really important sector because, you know, no one is kind of debating the impact of international logistics on the climate. And so now that also regulation is changing. So, for example, the SEC just launched an ESG task force and reporting requirements are just becoming more strict. Companies are being asked to consider their whole carbon footprint, including shipping. And so that's the reason why we see more companies that actually approach us um, they want to measure their footprint and also learn how to take action. Yeah, we've just coined a new term, by the way. It's carbon freight print. I just saw it on a Freightwaves T-shirt, so I, I think that's a good one. We should keep going with it. It's a nice play on words. Uh, Lauren, we've got, about yes. three, we've got about three minutes left, and I want to talk and finish this up with just the, your role at Tatcha and the role of sustainability leads and leaders uh, within retailers across the, across the globe. So just tell us a little bit about your role and, uh, the, you know, the difficulties of it, because it's not something that every company has, and I'm sure you meet challenges up and down. You know, talk about how influencing decisions up the supply chain uh, in your role. Yeah, so I would say that my role is to kind of be the protector and champion of sustainability at the company. So like I mentioned, we're a really small team for sustainability. Um, but in order to kind of do the work we do and do it in a meaningful way, it's kind of our job to put our little fingers in as many pots as possible um, and really empower everyone to do their job through the filter of sustainability and kind of create these little eco champions throughout the organization. And so that's working with our creative and design team to make sure that they know what inks are better to use for the environment and, you know, what finishes they can use that are still recyclable, et cetera, because we can't be everywhere at once. And so I would say the biggest challenge is kind of getting people excited about sustainability in a way where you're not just fear mongering. Um, sometimes people say that I have a delightful yet dark little gray cloud that kind of follows me around the office because I tend to interject and say, oh, no, you can't do that because if you do, X will happen. Um, and so I think the the biggest issue is making sure you do it in a way where people still like aren't nervous to see you pop up in a meeting and want to talk to you. Um, but yeah, I would say that the best thing you can do is kind of look for those allies in your organization and make sure that everyone is really pushing forward on sustainability, not just kind of one little siloed team. And Susie, do you have anything to add? Because these, again, like I said, sustainability teams are not very common at these companies. They're becoming more common, thank goodness. Uh, but it's often logistics uh, managers that are trying to put on their sustainability hat or it's sustainability managers trying to put on their logistics hat, as Kathleen told us the other day. Uh, do you have anything to add? Absolutely. So fundamentally, I believe that people want to do the right thing. But the hard question is how to do it. And what I found to be incredibly helpful is actually to leverage technology and data to really explain where your emissions coming from, you know, what can you do, how can you measure progress. And this is just like really encouraging, right, once you kind of understand for how to tackle this problem. And so I would encourage companies to, again, seek out partners, um, leverage technology wherever you can, because measuring is the first step. You know, you can only act if you really know what you want to improve, and that has been incredibly helpful. And All so right, thank I'm you, Lauren, for embracing this data challenge. <laughs> I know it was kind of a journey to get here, um, but it's really, really great to see what you have done. 
Yeah, well, thank you for taking on all of the data because that to me, I can gather it, but processing it is a whole different situation. It does seem like the partnership, uh, as we're seeing in real time live right here, uh, is definitely ne <laughs> is necessary. Uh, there's a lot of things to tackle here, but thank you both so much for doing this. I know this, is, uh, this has been fun. It hasn't been easy, but thank you so much for taking the time. Yep, thanks for having us. All right, can't wait Thank to you. do. We'll do this again soon. We'll, we'll have to check in on the partnership uh, and, and to talk to more about sustainability. This has been our sustainability focused episode here for Earth Week, as I'm calling it. Uh, this has been Point of Sale, episode 11. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, make sure to subscribe to Freightcast to get all of our FreightWaves audio uh, on one feed. You can also subscribe individually to Point of Sale Show wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple Music, or uh, Spotify. We will see you again next week. Thanks. Wow.